Brought the gavel. The meeting come to order. It's 4.02. We're on borrowed time. So um, I'd like to uh, welcome and thank all of you for coming today and uh, getting a little bit more information about what you've been hearing about. I take it you've all heard a little bit about what's going on, uh, perhaps at the fire pits, the, uh, uh, the bar, the driving range, or wherever it might be. Um, this is a super important meeting. It's a very important time for Briarwood Country Club going forward. And uh, I'm really uh, delighted that so many people are here today uh, to partake in the uh, uh, membership meeting. And uh, we've, uh, we've got a few things uh, uh, that we'd like to cover with you. And towards the end of the meeting, uh, we'll talk about the cost of these projects. And I know that's uh, what a lot of you have been uh, on pins and needles about, me too. And uh, so we'll get to that, but we're going to build up to that. So be patient. We'll get there. Um, I do want to thank, uh, you know, some of you may recognize Bob in the back room. Uh, he's, uh, he's your server as well as our official videographer. He's got, this, this fellow has so many talents, it, it'll boggle the mind. But uh, anyway, he's going to put together, yeah, so he'll video and uh, get your cocktails tonight. So, um, so anyway, uh, he's going to video this, and for those members who aren't able to attend, we're going to post this meeting on the, the website. Take us a little while to get it done, but uh, I'm convinced that Bob knows how to do it much better than the rest of us. So thank you, Bob, for uh, doing uh, uh, the good work here. Uh, we hope that this is informative. Uh, what we have planned for this evening is to talk about the facts of what we're doing, and uh, the reasons why we're doing it in maybe the order in which we have selected. Um, this is you know, um, intended to be informative, respectful. I can tell you that the, there's been a tremendous amount of effort amongst not only our committees and board, but as well as our consultants and superintendent, uh, September Hecox, myself, many others, many of you who are in the audience tonight, have contributed to uh, this discussion leading up to today. Um, and then uh, finally, we're going to do a couple of uh, times during this meeting where there will be some Q&A, uh, well, questions and hopefully answers. And uh, what I would like for you to do, and I'll announce these ahead of time, and if you would like, uh, we've got a microphone uh, up there in the it's kind of the center of the room over here. Um, I may move that over here so that you're not blocking the view of uh, one of the speakers. Um, is that okay with you, Bob? Sure. He said I couldn't do anything without him, so, um, all right. <clears throat> yeah, he's got the power. Anyway, so uh, we just ask that when you get up to the microphone, just identify yourself, and uh, 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 the question should be directed to either uh, one of our invited guests or myself or Ron Proach up here. Um, and, uh, again, looking forward to uh, exchange of information. So... Uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the goals of this, uh, this endeavor. We have uh, really two main goals. Um, one is to save water and meet the state mandate. Gary's going to get into the details of the uh, state mandate, the why and how much and how far we have to go to uh, meet this mandate. Um, he's not going to talk about the fairness of it. That was all of my crying you know, months and months and months ago, they can't possibly make us do this, but they are, in fact, going to make it a law. So uh, we have to accept that. So we're about saving water, meeting the mandate. And I have to say, just as important is that we are working towards um, having the best turf quality and health in the West Valley. We want Briarwood to be about pure playing conditions. And some of you think that, well, you know what, it's pretty good right now. It's good enough if we don't have to spend any more money. But the, uh, the fact is, is that we're dealing with an irrigation system that has been put together, and uh, some of it's been band-aided together, and uh, it's been around for a very long time. We've kind of uh, um, gone beyond its uh, normal, useful life, um, but we're still making it work most of the time. Um, the problem with doing that is that you aren't able to uh, direct the water for the time that you need it in the area that you want it. A lot of times we have to overwater or underwater because we can't be as specific as we'd like. 
Uh, there is a fair amount of science that gets uh, laid upon uh, uh, the turf that you play golf on. And uh, we're, we're really trying to, uh, to make sure that whatever we do, that we're going to get a better turf quality and playing experience in the corridors, the playing corridors of the golf course. Um, that's, that's equally as for us, for me, and I think most of you in here, it's as important as meeting this mandate. Um, <clears throat> so, let's see. I think that those are really the, uh, the two main goals, and then get answer any uh, questions that you might have. Um, did, did all of you see the uh, blast that I sent out this morning on the frequently asked questions? Um, if you did, raise your hand. I just want to kind of get an idea of, okay. I, uh, I printed out copies of that. They're on the table up front. Uh, if you'd like to grab a copy of it um, now or on your way out, that's fine as well. And what I did was try to answer a lot of the questions that have been, have made it to the office, uh, made it to a board member, made it to a committee member, somehow wandered around and hit my ears um, and emailed. In some cases, a lot of you emailed uh, some questions. So I've got a compilation of those and, and hopefully that answers some of your questions the best that they can be answered. Um, um, so what I want to do now is uh, introduce uh, our two um, uh, consultants. Uh, the first, Gary Brawley. Um, and I, Gary, what is your title again? What, what's your, what are you? Golf course architect. He's a golf course architect, does a lot of remediation, uh, uh, remodel, um, and he does design golf course. He's here for reasons I'm going to let him explain to you. But Gary's been in Arizona for a long, long time. And if you see a golf course in this, uh, in this region, he's probably had his hand on it uh, either when it was built or sometime after to do some um, extra work uh, to it as time goes on. He's no stranger to doing the, exactly the kind of work that we're talking about doing. In fact, uh, I think most of you here live in Sun City West. Um, he's been very involved with the rec centers and um, had a pretty long uh, presentation over at the rec centers. So without uh, any further ado, I'm going to introduce Gary Brawley and he can tell you what he's here for and what his, um, what his uh, thoughts are on our property. So, Gary? Thank you, Nate. Uh, yeah, so we'll see if that stays there. I'm a little taller than Nate is. Uh, yeah, so my name is Gary Brawley. I've been... I'm in the golf business in here in Arizona for 26 years. I actually worked here at Briarwood Country Club back in 98, 99. Mr. Turney, is that right? Back that long ago when we did some bunker work. So I worked for Gary Panks at the time and um, had a lot, uh, not as much gray hair at that point. But uh, um, so I've been really active um, in the in the golf business recently over the last couple of years with the Department of Water Resources because I saw. Um, what was the writing was on the wall dealing with golf and water in Arizona. So wanted to put a little bit of a presentation. Did you take the remote, Nate? Yeah, do you want the remote? That helped. All right. I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, what's going on in the state of Arizona with water and the fifth management plan. So the Arizona Department of Water Resources, which I'll refer to as ADWR going forward, in 1980, legislation was passed that they were, the department was to put together five management plans pretty much with a 10-year period in between them to selectively reduce water use in the state of Arizona. Um, so, in, so five of them in, in, uh, by 2025. In 1984 was when the first one was put in place that reduced the amount of turf that golf courses could have. So that's why after 1984, all your golf courses became more desert golf courses and were limited to 90 acres of turf. All the, the golf courses that were built prior to, the, to that were grandfathered in with their water rights. Water rights at that point were based on the number of turf areas you had and the number acres of lakes. And the, the dealing with the lakes was for recharge only. So today, we're at the fifth management plan. The fourth management plan has taken them 20 years to put in place. It actually goes in place uh, January 1st of 2023. It'll be in place for two years, and then the, the fifth management plan um, goes into place. It's by far the most restrictive thing I've seen to the golf industry in Arizona in the 26 years I've been here. 
um, especially as it relates to the pre-1984 golf courses, the older, larger turf golf courses. So this is dealing with golf courses only that deal with groundwater. So the, the golf courses that, that are on CAP or SRP water right now are not having these restrictions, although some of them have to commingle the two types of water, so they're going to get these restrictions. So, you know, Briarwood, there's, I think there's 180 golf courses in the active management areas that were built prior to 1984, some down in Tucson, uh, Prescott, that are all in the same boat. So th this isn't just happening at Briarwood. I mean, even, even your Phoenix Country Club, Mesa Country Club, those old, older private clubs that, you know, were built in the 1950s that are wall-to-wall -wall turf are, are reeling right now, too, with what these water mandates are coming. So they've been drafting the mass, this fifth management plan for about three years. So it's been, um, it's not something that just all of a sudden came out. There's been a series of public meetings. There was one public meeting uh, last year that there was over 500 attendees, mostly from the golf business, um, in, in, involved in that meeting because of the impact that it is having on our water. Um, and there's currently no plan for the sixth management plan. So one of the things right now is the fifth management plan, that's it. There's no end date of this. Not that they would ever give us more water, but there is no other plan. In fact, there was just beginning of this year, there was legislation on the floor to be voted on to put a time limit on the fifth management plan, and it did not pass a House vote. So right now, we're going to be stuck with this fifth management plan, and that's why we've been fighting as an industry. Uh, my colleague Galen Coates and I, you know, I've been in every one of these meetings uh, dealing with water and, and the golf industry. So the schedule right now is that the, the department is going to adopt the fifth management plan, will, which will be in the fall. So they're, they're pretty much at a 95% draft. And Nate, maybe you could put the fifth management plan up on your website if they wanted to, to read it. There's certain pages if, if you're a water or engineer that has that stuff to read um, how all this came about. Um, and so once the plan gets adopted, we have 90 days for, again, for public comment. Briarwood has already provided one round of, of comments to ADWR. In addition, we had a, a meeting specifically with ADWR just for Briarwood with Nate and, and September and Ron and I um, to talk to them specifically about what we're doing here. Um, the, the department understands the impact this is going to have on the older golf courses. So there's some, some means to do different things, but you know, right now the, their plan is to put in place uh, this management plan by, by 2025. So, so by law, it'll get adopted, and it has to be on the, 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 the floor for 90 days before it can become rule, and then it has to be rule in statutory for two years before it becomes law. So I will tell you that there's a lot of other people out there that are fighting for water rights, and everything that they're fighting for would apply to Briarwood. So you're, you're fortunate, too, that you have some, some bigger dollar clubs that, that are lawyering up and have, have lobbyists and, and all kinds of stuff that are, that are meeting with ADWR, dealing with the exact same things that we're dealing with. Um, so there, there, is a, there is some pushback um, going forward. So but we don't know what, what they're ultimately going to do. So the, the, this is the one I, I, I think these are important to educate everybody about the golf industry itself in Arizona. You know, public perception is our golf courses use a lot of water. Um, public perception is, you know, they, we could just turn our golf course water off and let them go. Well, there's not anybody in this room that wants their golf course to look like that. In reality is the state of Arizona, golf courses only use 1.9% of the state's groundwater withdrawal, whereas agriculture is over 75%. The current fifth management plan is targeting us for a, a, a cross the board 3% reduction in, in water use based on the golf industry. The thing is the golf industry is a $3.9 billion financial contribution to the state's economy. So we have a, a big, financial impact to the state for golf. Um, the, the allied associations put together this a few years ago to, to determine what that financial impact was um, because we wanted to prove to people um, what we do. So a little bit about you know, golf irrigation 
and how are we at 1.9%? Again, this is, I think is extremely valuable when I have a room like this to understand what your superintendent does with an efficient irrigation system um, for managing water. You know, he, ba he waters based on ET, which is a evapotranspiration rate. So every day he's taking into account what the weather is, what the wind rate is, how much the soil is dried out, how much more water he needs to apply based on the plants he has. There's a high level of science that goes into every night what he waters. I talked to, to Ron the other day and it was a real, this was a couple weeks ago, it was a real windy night and he didn't water because the, he, he just said my distribution is not going to be good because it was blowing 31 all night. So he just didn't water. Well, I guarantee 90%, 100% of the residents in Sun City West in, in the valley that were scheduled to water on that Tuesday night watered on Tuesday night, even though half of it blew into their rocks and their plants. So, so we water very tightly based on what we do. In today's world, you know, our irrigation heads are staked with sub-center meter accuracy GPS. Galen Coates is the, an irrigation consultant. He's going to talk a little bit more about this stuff. But we are very precise anymore with our spacings because we, have, we need to maximize those efficiencies. We understand as a business that we have to manage our water that we put out on our golf courses. We always have. That's why the golf industry is such a great thing. But, but if, if you have triangulated spacing and they're 65, 80, and 70 foot spacing, well, you're going to have all kinds of different water problems. So we have to make sure that we're tight on those efficiencies. You know, another good sign of the golf business in Arizona is Rainbird and Toro use us as a test market. Rainbird is, has a major manufacturing plant down in Tucson. Um, so we are, we are a test market for golf irrigation globally. It happens right here. We were, Arizona was the first, had the very first central um, computer ever built on a golf course was put in Arizona to manage the water. It was Ahwatukee Lakes, right, Galen? Mm -hmm. I have a picture of my former boss, Mr. Gary Panks, standing next to this thing, and it was half the size of this room. <laughs> it, was, it was massive, but that was the first central computer. Now we're down to the fact that these newer systems, your superintendents can run them on their phones. So we've gone a long way, but a lot of that's been happening in Arizona because we're growing grass in an arid environment that's not supposed to be growing grass. Right, and so we have to be good with our water. Um, we we have weather stations out there that are monitoring weather every day, and then we also the newer systems all have individual head control, and we're able to manage those those precip rates based on the second, whereas his your current system is based on the minute. So we're able to to there's better efficiencies on how much we water. So those irrigation heads that sit in the low areas don't need as much water because surface flow goes down to those areas, whereas those heads that sit up and water the mounds or the tops of mounds or south-facing slopes that need a little bit more water, these newer systems have that ability that the superintendent can manage his water better and only turn on one head to manage that area and get you guys the turf playing conditions you want. So we talk about you know, the age of, of Briarwood and the, the Allied Association, then, Nate, I think I have, you've, I have this too that you could put on the website that's a little more legible. You can't see that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on. So, what it says, so the Allied Associations, Nationally Golf Course Superintendents Association, um, Golf Course Owners Association, Golf Course, um, American Society of Golf Course Architects, USGA, a few years ago, they all got together and put together this lifespan of a golf course. Um, it's kind of a little cheat sheet. We use it, Galen uses it, as we talk to clubs about the age of golf courses. Now, there are variables that come into play on this, but if you could read this, it says that you know, irrigation lifespan is, is somewhere between 15 and 30 years you know, before the parts start to wear out. It's just like our houses. Where we still have to you know, paint them. We have to update the faucets and all that kind of stuff. The same thing with the golf courses. There's... Though our water in Arizona is not the best either, so it's very hard. You know, it's hard on the pipes. You know, those things need to be taken into account when um, we go into the water. So I'm going to turn it over to Galen now to talk a little bit more about specifically about the irrigation. But that's the questions on ADWR. Do you want me to take questions on ADWR stuff, Nate? Sure. Why don't we do that now? Anyone? Questions on um, the mandate of upcoming? Okay. 
We do. Uh, the AWBR allows establishments, including Briarwood, to request an extension, and the extension can be up to five years. How is that, like, would we thought about that? Is Briarwood re you know, requesting an extension? Can we spread these projects out over the five years? Right. Yes. So that is, yeah, we are, we are having those conversations right now. They ADW is just now starting to look at those. It doesn't become official until the plan's adopted. So we don't get any official, um, you know, approval of that variance. You know, they can give they by statute they can give you up to a five year variance. So you could potentially get up till 2030. And we there's a there's a whole um, application process that you have to show. You know, you have to show due diligence every year to water conservation to get to that allotment. You know, they don't let, just let you take five years more and just do it all at the end of the five years. So, yes, that is true. In addition, it's, they, we can't do it yet. So until it becomes adopted, they don't allow us to do that. We can start having those conversations. They just told us, in fact, in our meeting a month ago, that they will start to have those conversations, and that's something that we're... We, we are aware of and are working on. I will add too that the Arizona Office of Tourism um, had a grant program that came out for, it was called the Legacy Golf Course Grant, and it was a, a, a grant application that Briarwood applied for and received. Um, it was $105,000, that was the, the cap, um, and Briarwood did apply for that, and that had to be used towards water conservation efforts, and it went towards some of the pipeline work that was done. So, so you know, the club went ahead and we got all that done and, and approved and um, for that. So that was free money, it was non-competitive, it was just a process, so. so they are in uh, not only in Arizona, but uh, internationally as well. And uh, wealth of information, no, and no stranger to Briarwood besides, so thank you. Thank you. I'm a little taller than Gary. <laughs> Um, it's great to be with you. Um, you have a wonderful facility that just needs to get current. Everything in life changes. We don't like change, some of us, but if we stay involved with it a piece at a time, it's not as painful. Um, we have been on the advisory committee of ADWR since its inception in 2000 and, and uh, excuse me, 1980. And so we've watched what's happening. This management act that Gary has talked about will happen. They don't back away from them. It just requires certain legislation and certain ways in which it's presented so that legally the attorneys don't get in a big dispute with each other. That's what's really going on. Our part of irrigation is basically this. You have this fantastic facility but you don't have enough water to support it at the rate you're using it. The concept is this. We want to put about two and a half inches of water in the ground every week. And we want to do it on an efficient basis or we're wasting our resource. Ron doesn't have the current tools to do that. The superintendent, the tools are worn out. Every one of those sprinkler heads out there has a gearbox in it like a transmission in your car, an automatic transmission. It wears out. And what's happened is all those sprinkler heads are of different types. They're not all the same. Just because of through the years things got replaced with what they had on hand to replace it. So those sprinkler heads are like everybody in this room. We're all different. And they need to be similar. And so when they're all different, they put out a different amount of water. One puts out 30 gallons a minute near the pump station. One puts out 20. One puts out 15. What that means is, is we don't put an even amount of water of two and a half inches a week in the ground. We got some water this deep, and we got some water that deep. Real basic. So we've got to straighten that out. We want to find water. We find water that you already have by getting it efficiently it, distributed. Does that make sense? That's, it's, that's the whole science of this whole thing. The weather stations are fantastic, uh, but you need a person like Ron to make good decisions in spite of what the weather station says I'm going to do today. So that's where thinking and experience comes in. 
I know you're all familiar with what experience is worth. Um, and so that's what this is really about. So you've got a pump station that's 23 years old. The pump station has a big motor on top and it just spins a pump below ground like a bucket of water, just spins it around and around and around and it pulls it out and sends it out to the irrigation system. Well, you've got your pump spinning like this, the motor saying, I'm going to use 400 kilowatt hours, I'm going to use that and I'm going to put it out through this pump and I'm going to put it out on the irrigation system to all those indifferent heads and get different amounts of water in the ground. Another challenge your pump station is probably you're, you're, you'll be lucky to be 60% efficient with your pump station. As things wear out, like your car, like everything in your home, they become less efficient. You spend more money that is never received because it just takes the same amount of energy and you get 50% of its worth. And that's kind of what's going on. So we don't need to resurrect the whole irrigation system. What we need to do is we need to get some of the parts in sync with the orchestra. We need a conductor. The conductor is run with a computer and with sprinkler controllers and heads that are just on the same page. They got the same music. When you got different music, you're going to go wherever they go and spray wherever they're going to spray. Also, Gary is bringing in the concept of how to make some turf reduction down the road uh, because we're going to find more water by getting not irrigating every portion wall to wall. And that's a decision that we don't make. It's a decision that Gary makes with your club and with your committees, etc. So long story short, we need to find what water you have and use it efficiently. We need to prepare for the water reduction, which is going to happen. And many of you have heard about the depth of water in Lake Mead and Lake Powell. Now, that's surface water. That isn't necessarily going to be the problem here, but it's all related as far as the concept of water conservation. So if I got on, some, on surface water, just so you'll know, if I got three-thirds, if I got three feet of it, and this next year, that surface water, they're going to say, you're going to get, to get two feet of it. We're going to take a third of it away to users. That's what's happening. So we have to be efficient enough to be able to operate under those conditions. DWR, the Department of Water Resources, they're saying, we're going to reduce your amount of acre feet of water that you have the allotment for. You have 700 and some acre feet, and you're going to be cut to 500 and 40. 40. 40. And that's their regulation. That's how they regulate the water. See, the whole goal of DWR, if there's a big goal, is to make sure we have enough drinking water, okay, so that we, we can live and reduce the recreational water down to where it isn't, including farming, isn't dominant. And there you bring in other types of water, which is another subject, which isn't one I'm going to discuss today. But the whole idea is become efficient with your water bank, with your water account. Think of it as a checkbook. You got so much in there, and you got to distribute it evenly and efficiently. And that's what we're trying to do. The instruments of weather stations, computers, and all that, they're great. But if you don't have the bread and butter in the right place, the sprinkler heads, and the operation of them, you can't put an even amount of water in the ground. And that's what we've learned from years of science. Um, this is really a science. It isn't just some by guess and by golly. We did by guess and by golly many years ago, but we're way past that now. So um, our goal is to help you find the water you already have out there. Some of it is just being lost in the air. Some of it is not distributing evenly. And that's what's going on. Uh, any questions? Yes. I got a question. Is our system set up that it would lend itself to, say, modifying and changing two holes a year for 10 years? Is your system currently set up to do that? And is it likely that that's the way to go? No. Can you explain a little bit? Yes. 
Irrigation equipment increases in cost. Equipment alone, 7 to 10 percent every year. Do the math. Now, the, the installation is even more than that with what's going on today. So the longer you wait, and, and I've been in this business 40 years, I've never seen the price of irrigation equipment ever go down. I don't care if it's a recession, a depression, or whatever. So the deal is, is it's just going to cost you, it's going to become unaffordable. I have a project which is a homeowner association, not a golf course, um, in the area that we estimated 18 years ago was about uh, $600,000 to convert it to uh, 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 actually SRP water, okay, another water. We just finished it, it was over 300, $3,900,000. You could have borrowed the money. I mean, if, if you're in that game, but you, 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 you wait, you're just going to pay more and more. Plus, as Gary explained, you got the problem with DWR saying you will reduce your water quantity uh, or you will have penalties, fines. And I have three golf courses right now that I've been dealing with for some time, over 13 years, that are dust bowls. They turn the water off because the golf course was a separate entity from the homeowner association and you have a different so so the reality is it you just need to preserve what you have if you want a golf course and let's use the resources more efficiently yes will we lose our lake no. will you lose your lake yes. no but the A lot, that's a, a subjective term. About six, since I'm six foot two here, uh, that's how much is evaporated off the top of a lake per year. But there's nothing we can do about that except do some more efficient with the lake work. But that, that isn't where the big water loss is. The big water loss is you're not spraying the water in the right places. That's where the big, the big percentage of loss is. Yes. What is your particular task uh, in this project going forward if, if this all kind of keeps moving in that direction? Uh, we will go take a GPS device. That's just a device that goes out and, and uh, actually collects where the sprinkler heads are, where the, tree, where the uh, cart path is, where the greens are, where the bunkers are, and we put it into a map that you can actually and put the symbols on it so you can actually, it looks like a golf course. So we're go, supposed to go collect all that information, and that's where all the existing sprinkler heads are and clocks and stuff, okay? The sprinkler heads. That's all of you guys because you're all different and all those out there are different. We're going to give that to Gary Brawley, and Gary's going to start to create a turf line that is efficient on how to get, the, without redoing the whole irrigation system, okay? He's going to carve it out the turf line and so you you become more efficient that way as well so we collect then we end up designing it sufficiently enough to where it can be new heads can be put in the ground same spot in most cases we collect the data put it in the computer give it to Ron approach and Ron starts to operate efficiently with a system yes so if, uh, if we go forward with the project, should we expect the changes that are uh, planned to be made to last us through another 15, 30, in our case, 40 years? <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> 40 years later. I, that sounds biblical. <laughs> 40. <laughs> 40. Uh, you can certainly expect to get 25 to 30 years out of the system, yes. Now, now let, let me be real clear. The sprinkler heads have a gearbox. They just flat wear out after so many years. You just put another one back in. Uh, the, the pump motors sometimes burn out. You replace the motor. You don't replace any of the big piping. You don't replace all of the arteries out there because right now they're functioning quite well. They just don't have the right orchestra. They don't have the right conductor tone. So does that answer your question? Yes. I guess I'm 
guess what I was looking for is that we won't have another one of these repairs another 10 years or 15 years. We should expect the life of this new system to extend on into maybe 25 years with, uh, you know, the occasional the repair of a sprinkler head or a motor or something like that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Is there a feedback system? Uh, sprinklers themselves are great, but you've got to have some way to monitor uh, to know where your adjustments have to be made. Now, how do you do that? Well, great question. The only reason we have a computer in these systems is to be able to uh, organize each head on what it's supposed to do. So the highs and lows that Gary talked about, you have a high area, mounted area, you have a low retention area. Those are all on separate operational times. And so how you do that is you organize this so that you can operate them efficiently for their particular needs and not all the same. Like all of your sprinkler heads, all of you operate the same. No, we're going to have some of you at 10 minutes, some of you at 30 minutes, some of you at 5 minutes, and some of you are going to water four times a day, and some of you are going to water once. So the, the system has that ability to do that. We don't use those very often because they're not efficient. What we use is what Gary Brawley talked about, evapotranspiration pan rate. There's a pan. It's a scientific device that's been used for years. And whatever evaporates, we want to put back in the soil. Now, the feedback you're talking about, yes, there's a feedback from each head to the controller to the computer that will let us know whether that operated or not. So we have a mechanical or a device of feedback so we know whether how we need to go check and monitor what's going on. But evapotranspiration pan rate we found is the most efficient way to operate large turf facilities because the soil is not the same throughout the facility. So if you put a moisture sensor at every sprinkler head, which would be economically Im <laughs> impossible, the device and 10% of them go out a year, you're just chasing your tail. So because the soils are not all the same, the depth, we use the pan rate to put down back what evaporated or was used in the soil by that area, that sprinkler each day, the vegetation. That's how, that's the most scientific way that we found to, to irrigate. And by the way, uh, Gary mentioned, uh, uh, you, you live in a, in a particular place in the world. Uh, we've done a lot of work all over the world. You live in a place where this is where the best science of irrigation operation and performance and maintenance has ever been done. This is the model. A law, the law that came about in 2008, uh, excuse me, 1980 and 81, helped create an environment to get the best operators and the best what, uh, forms of irrigation science in the world. I've been to the South Pacific, I've been to Hawaii, I've been all over the place, and I'm telling you, the best science and operation is here. This is where it was kind of learned. Many of the people here went to those foreign environments to teach the rest of the world how to irrigate. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, one more part. So by watering more efficiently, um, Ron puts a lot of uh, chemicals on the golf course to fertilizer, weed killer, heaven knows what. By watering more efficiency, uh, efficiently, should we expect uh, to get a greater efficiency from the chemicals that he puts on there, thereby saving us money? Scientifically, that's absolutely true. The idea is that we want to use less water which will equal less whatever Ron's putting down or, or it will last longer its life will be longer rather than leach it all the way through gone over with wasted fertilizer is a perfect example how you fertilize with water is a big deal you can 
have twice the, twice the uh, effectiveness of a fertilizer if you know how to irrigate correctly. But if you don't have a system that irrigates correctly, one that operates this deep of water and this deep, there's no way you can accomplish that task. Thank you. Oh, question? Sorry. Yeah, is our, is our water uh, that we use for golf courses, does that come from a separate source than uh, the people that are uh, building these 100,000 houses in, in the Phoenix area? Are they uh, re reducing our water so they can build that many more houses? No. No, you have a well water uh, delivery system. There's a hole in the ground that goes down 1,000 feet. 800 and some odd. 800 feet. Think of a shaft in the ground going down 800 feet, and we're pulling the water out. And this property, this area, that well is registered with the Department of Water Resources, and that well is for your use for this facility, which was grandfathered in in, 2000, in 1981. And so you're not taking anybody's drinking water and they are not taking yours. They're having to use potable drinking water for the those facilities unless we come up with a reclaimed sewage treated water to help them build those facilities which makes them uh, viable. Now those facilities you're talking about in Phoenix or anywhere, if any of them are over 10 acres of turf, 10, then they cannot use potable drinking water. They would have to find another source. Why? That way we're preserving drinking water for the people that live there. Because they have to have a 100 year supply guaranteed before they can build those developments. So the water you're using is actually farm water converted to golf water historically. I just, I just wanted to add something to what Galen said. Um, <laughs> So he talked about an acre foot of water. So that's like 350,000 gallons of water. So, you know, for every acre feet, that's enough water to sustain 10 individuals a year. So when we're talking about, you know, needing to, to reduce our allocation by 160 acre feet, we're talking about enough water for 160 or 1,600 individuals. Now, just to put that into perspective, how much water, you know, we're looking at carving out, it's a lot. I mean, it's a pretty significant number. And the, you know, there's a couple other things like the talking about, someone asked about the Department of Water Resources. I sent a question to them and says, well, what if a club doesn't want to, you know, meet this requirement? Two things. One, the state has hired two planners and all they're doing is, is monitoring golf course water. Right now, the state does not have good records of what we have on what we're using. They have two people that all they're doing right now is working on golf course water and, and monitoring. So I think it's gonna become a lot more restrictive of what water use was. Um, they're taking this much more serious than they had in the past. So my question was what happens if they don't? The lawyer for the department replied back to my email, which I thought was strange, and then referred to me all these municipal codes and the fine for illegal with, with groundwater withdrawal is $10,000 a day, and they shut your water down. So they're not messing around, and that's in the civil codes. He, I've got all the V, star, dollar sign, D, whatever, to get to that, but I was shocked. Like, it could be up to $10,000 a day um, if you go over your groundwater allocation. The, the challenge in our world is, and when we're dealing with this size of projects, these things can't change overnight. But you can't just change it overnight. If you go without water on your greens in the month of June for a week, they're gone. And now you don't have a golf course, you know, for a while. So, you know, that's kind of what some of the planning has been is like, look, we've got to know where we're going to be going forward. So, um, you know, for that. Gary? Yep. You might talk about what the recovery cost would be to redo those greens. Yeah, and yeah, the recovery cost, if you had to, redo your greens, they're looking at, you know, a million dollars just to redo those. You know, the, you, know the, you asked the question, sir, about irrigation systems, and, you know, Galen's really trying to look at, you know, this, this property and, and what can we do efficiently. If we were to redo the whole system, pipe and everything, you're looking at 
with today's value, five million plus, you know, to do to do the new a new irrigation system. What's Grand Views? Price? You know, in that range. So, you know, it's so you know Galen saying, hey, you know, the piping's good. They're not having a lot of breaks on the piping. Um, you know, we, we can get the right heads in there and greatly make improvements to the efficiencies of the irrigation system and not spend that number. So you know, we're, we're, we're looking at all means for you guys. Um, you know, this, I'm doing this a lot and, you know, trying to figure out ways to get this, this through. So I'll turn back over to Nate. Okay. I have one question. Uh, you said two and a half inches of water a week. That would be about 10 acres for 90 acres, that would be 900 acres of water. My understanding is we only have about 500, we only have 500 acres of water. A lot, but will this efficiency make up the difference of what two and a half inches of water put on today? I, I didn't complete my 2.5 acre or uh, inches of water. That's peak. Oh, okay. January, so it, it every month, the rate changes. Actually, every week, every day. So I gave you a peak to keep that kind of grass happy. Um, so yes, it will vary. If, if, I, if I built a chart for you, you'd see the chart go according to the temperature variation and the season. That's what it does. It's a 10 to 1 ratio, if that helps. How many acre feet do we need today to maintain our I'm going to let Ron answer that. What we're currently irrigating? Right. If, if, if we've been averaging for this, so we did a chart the there last 30 years, we're averaging about 702 acre feet per year. We now have to go from that to the five, call it 540, 550. Mm -hmm. will, so, the, will the efficiency of the new water system bring us that much more efficiency? Will it drop our efficiency? The, the combination of what we've done with the pipeline, limiting the creek, the irrigation system, and the controls. And so right now, we, we monitor the lakes on a daily basis. So everything we pull out of the well, we have a, a figure. It's 1,000 gallons. I put 900 on the, on the golf course last night. Where's the other 100 going? We're losing that. And, and that's what we're monitoring. So in two months, six months, eight months, 10 months, we're gonna have a really, really good number on what we actually know we're losing in the lakes. Because to, to the point, every single month, the evaporation rate is different. So Department of Water Resources has a formula and they say, okay, we're gonna give you six acre feet a year, whatever that number is, because we know that's what you lose in evaporation. So once we monitor the lakes, and, and, and I'm more comfortable at 10 to 12 months, because then we really have a really strong, firm number going through the cool season, the hot summer, you know, the, the um, it, it gets us a better number. If we do everything that we're talking about, we'll be able to hit that number and probably get below that and below what we we're only currently allowed to pull 484 out of our well. And the rest we purchased from Sun City Rec, from West. If we do everything we're talking about, we can eliminate all of the extra stuff we have to purchase because our well that's on site will give us enough to stay within our parameters of the 90 acres. Now, again, everybody asks about the oil. If you want to oversee the golf course wall to wall, well, that could be another story. But if, if we can get to these numbers with the irrigation efficiency and monitor the lakes for, say, the next 10 to 12 months, <coughs> maybe only one of the lakes has to be done right. To, to the point, the plan we, we put together to get the grant, we have to do something very, very similar with Department of Owners to going ask for that variance. Nothing is guaranteed, but if we put a plan together and say, hey, you know what, year one, we reduced our overseeding. We reduced, uh, we got rid of our creek. We saved this much water. Uh, we're changing out our sprinkler heads. It's easy for the Department of Water Resources to say, you know what, we're good with what you're doing. You can have until 2030. 
that's what we're working, the plan is working. What can we do each year to make it palatable? Because it is, it's a big number. If we threw everything in, lakes, irrigation, everything, it's, it's millions upon millions. All right, so uh, uh, gentlemen, I want to thank uh, you guys for um, your, your discussion today. It's uh, hopefully been informative. Um, I'll ask you to stick around in, in case uh, someone is uh, percolating on a, on, no pun intended, uh, a question that comes up later. And if you can stick, uh, we should just have about another 20 minutes or so to go. Um, the other part uh, that I want to get to is the um, order of projects uh, uh, that are involved in, in this water management uh, situation. Um, and I'll talk to you about uh, a couple of them in some detail. Um, we've done the creek. Um, we, we selected the creek first because we knew that we were losing a significant amount of water through seepage. We could, uh, we could determine that uh, without scientific equipment. And it was felt that, and on top of that, we had the available contractor that could readily do that project. Part of the problem today is that it's difficult to line up contractors to do some of this work because there's a flood of money going into the market and there's only so many contractors in Arizona. So it really takes a long time to get <coughs> people lined up. We did have a, a gentleman who was uh, ready, willing, and able to, uh, to trench that uh, uh, line all the way down to the 14th uh, lake uh, to get the water from 10 to uh, 14 to get it to, to get it out of the creek basically um, so there was that um, and we also had the timing of the uh, the grant program through the state of Arizona for 105,000 uh, we did have available cash that we could put into this project with the understanding that eventually this would be part of the big the bigger project so it was a pretty affordable project two hundred twenty nine thousand dollars and uh, I think is is already paying dividends. I look at our water bill, excuse me, I look at our electricity bill uh, on the golf course every month to monitor and compare to prior years. And I can tell you already that our irrigation pump is not, uh, not irrigate, our well pump is not pumping near as much as we have. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's a significant amount less because we're just not spending that wa uh, money on electricity. Um, so that is paying off. So we, we get to the, the second part of the project, um, and there's a decision to be made. Um, it's about the irrigation system that we've been discussing and the efficiencies or lakes. We know we're losing money on lakes. I have to tell you, fixing uh, the uh, sides of 8-9 uh, um, is cheaper than putting in this new irrigation system, right? Um, significantly also. However, um, I also know that Ron is having problems on a daily, weekly basis on putting water where it needs to go, on it turning off when it's supposed to turn off. Um, I think we had a tournament, uh, it was the uh, Silver Bell, it was in December, and one, nine, uh, ten, all the way down to the pond looked like a raging river because one of the satellites decided that it would go to sleep on the computer and it would just let the water continue to run. Um, and, and that's a massive loss. Uh, that's a lot of gallons. That's a lot of, uh, it's not an acre foot, but it's a lot of water down the drain. And that's a big example. That's just the one that we saw. We, we see this, uh, you know, probably once a month, I would say, in the last six months where there's a satellite that has gone to sleep on us and it either doesn't turn on water, which is problematic, causes us to overwater the next evening if we get, get it up and running. So there's a lot of problems that go on with the irrigation system that affects the playability of the golf course. You know, every day you go out there and you hit the ball in the fairway just like you're supposed to, and uh, you hit a dry spot or a hard pan spot or whatever it is, and we have them out there. You, you see them. Um, and if, if we were applying water on the golf course to a more accurate uh, distribution and uh, efficiency, um, <coughs> you would see... Uh, I think a marked improvement. I've been at golf courses that have done irrigation systems and the number one complaint was that there was so much more grass for the superintendent to mow. It was incredible because we were growing grasses in places that we just hadn't grown before. So the ability to put water, how much, where you want it, makes a big difference to the playability of the golf course. 
Um, the other part of it is these satellites that we talk about. Uh, those parts, uh, frankly, they're old as the hills. They don't make those parts anymore. So Ron has to search for um, uh, rehab, re uh, refurbished uh, parts. And those things are getting harder to find. And guess what? Anyone who wants a refurbished part needs it really bad. So when you have supply and demand, all of a sudden the leverage goes to the seller. You can sell that thing for just about whatever you want because the desperation is, is present. So they're costly and eventually they're going to run out of those as well. So it's something that's coming. We definitely need to be looking towards that. We get the benefit of saving water um, on, a, on a daily, nightly, uh, weekly, and annual basis, as well as getting better water application to the playing corridors that you all enjoy. And it, we, it gives us a better playing surface as well as saving water. When we get to the end of this water, uh, the irrigation system, like I said at the beginning, we'll be able to evaluate how much more water we really need to get to. Um, we'll have a very good idea at that point, assuming this all goes forward, as to how much water is being lost through the lake system. From that point, Ron and, and some of these gentlemen can be able to decipher, you know, which lake first, uh, do we need to do that? Two of them, are we still 75 acre feet? You know, they'll be able to do the math pretty easily to figure out how much more. So it was just seen as a much better value uh, for the club and the members to enjoy playing golf. You're gonna have less grass, but it'll be better turf. I mean, that's kind of the promise, the unwritten promise. Well, it's written, I'd write that. So we'll get better playing conditions and saving more water. That's probably a pretty good thing. And as long as you don't play in the perimeters of the golf course, okay? <laughs> that's gonna take a while. So again, um, that pause after we get this uh, part of the project done to really analyze the water savings and what's, what's next, uh, then we can create a logical next step process. Uh, we can figure out where the biggest gain on lakes is going to be, which ones to fix, probably eight and nine, uh, probably the irrigation pond and the final. I'll leave that to these guys that uh, make a living at it. So now the fun part, the cost of uh, what I would call phase one. Now, this will be posted, so you don't have to, I'm not going to pop this up on the screen, so you'll all have a copy of this, and you can uh, uh, noodle through it at your convenience at the kitchen table. Um, so I've got a, a lineup of projects. Uh, we did the creek bed. Our net cost on that was $105,000. The second project in this first phase is the purchase of satellites and installation. That's $357,065. Okay, they're not cheap. 51 of them, something 54. like 54. Um, this, the uh, proposed uh, start date would be May of 23. If we bought them today, we really couldn't get the contractor to do the install and the labor uh, until May of 23. The finish date of those uh, satellites would be August of that same year. So next year, May, uh, uh, next month in uh, next year's time, um, we would begin and, and we'd likely be able to finish in August of 23. Project four, irrigation pump replacement. Now, we have budgeted $275,000 for the replacement. This includes the skid, that big metal uh, uh, platform that it sits on, as well as the irrigation pump itself. And that's worst case scenario if, if there aren't major components that can be replaced within that and get a really good benefit uh, you know, maybe 10, 15 years uh, of, of good life um, with, a, with a major repair, um, then we'll take a look at it. I've budgeted the high number, and that's $275,000. Uh, we have someone looking, uh, doing an inspection to try to give us a, an understanding if you're, we're going to spend, uh, you know, uh, $175,000 to save 50, that type of thing. So uh, we'll take a look at that. That would also take place in May of 23. Uh, that would be done right quickly because you can um, probably a, a couple of days within the uh, maybe three to five days, something like that. No, three days? Two days. Two days. I guess they're in a hurry to get that uh, pump motor going because without that, you're not going to get water on the golf course. So um, that would take place quickly um, at the con you know as those satellites are being installed. Um, so. You know, I skipped the irrigation head. The third one, sorry, I skipped the line here. Uh, irrigation head purchase and installation. 
Buckle your seat belts because that's a wild ride. There's about 1,800 of them. The number is $726,460. That includes, that's about three quarters of a million dollars for quick math. Uh, that includes installation, uh, purchase fairly quickly. Uh, that price is going up. We've missed the first price discount. If someone in this room wants to write us a check for $726,460, I can save us $100,000 by getting it, uh, by buying them before uh, the end of this, uh, what is it, May 1st? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably not going to happen. But I am available, <laughs> just in case. All right, so uh, yeah, I apologize. I, I, I skipped uh, Project 3. That's the big meat of it there. So we're over a million dollars. We're at a million and a quarter. Uh, and, and now with uh, our consulting cost of, of all the planning to make sure that this gets done properly and that we know what we're really doing, a little verification of things, um, uh, we've got the consulting at $70,000. Um, and uh, if all went perfectly, uh, this, this project would be done uh, in complete by August of 23. Um, the total cost of the first phase is a million five hundred and fifty two thousand five twenty five all right so a lot of you are really good and you're working the calculators I can see it now I'm gonna save you the trouble at our membership um, rate right now we're at 180 equity members we're at 74 non-residents um, for an equity member now I'm gonna preface this I know you're on the edge of your seat um, we do have a um, our bank Bell Bank um, is willing to provide a financing option. We, as you know from my FAQ that I sent out this morning, we looked at financing member um, payments. Um, very complex, probably not going to work for us. Um, and, and so our bank is willing to finance the project for individual members um, to give it a, a more palatable monthly if you don't want to write a big check. So you still have to, you still have to vote for this, bear in mind. Um, Equity member one-time assessment, $7,154. For a non-resident, which by bylaws um, is 50%, it's $3,577. Now that assumes today's membership count. So for those of us who are concerned about these things, um, we think that at the end of May, this is going to be, uh, we'll be at 173 equity and still 74 non-resident. At 173, not 180, uh, that assessment goes to $7,410. Commensurate for the non-resident, 3,700. Now, assuming a lot of times you do a, a project like this and um, amazingly people evaluate how much fun they're having playing golf, how they're feeling, what the long term is for them, and you get, a, you get some people that resign. Um, at 156 equity members, which is a loss of 10%, that takes the assessment to $8,214. And again, this will be available for you on, uh, I'll probably just uh, send it to you in the form of a blast. Um, Non-resident at 66, another 10% loss, that's 4,100. So those are the kind of dollar figures that we're talking about. If you're interested in um, financing, it, at 36 months, it'd be a couple hundred dollars a month. 60 months, 130 bucks a month, somewhere in that ballpark. Really depends on the interest rate that, that goes with it. Um, and non-residents, obviously, a lot less. So, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got a member in the room uh, tonight who will go nameless. Um, and I remember several, quite a few months ago going through some old documents uh, on, on the computer. And back in 2000, this individual member wrote a fairly strongly worded letter to the membership. Uh, one, of the, one of the power is someone on the strategic planning committee, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it was really about the importance of water um, uh, management and about saving. And uh, it was a very um, nicely articulated letter. It talked about the importance. It talked about 90-acre golf courses being built today for the obvious reasons. This individual sort of forecasted 
And, um, you know, obviously nothing really got done. And I can tell you that this individual is very, uh, what's the right word for it? Persuasive. He's smart. He does his homework. He's got, I have a lot of respect for this individual. And uh, it didn't happen. And I'm sure that it was very frustrating. And, and I think I have a good idea why. When you get to these hard conversations with your membership, you know, we're talking about the next 20 to 30 years of the club. Most of you are going to be here for a long time. This gentleman is here tonight. He wrote the letter 20 years ago. He's doing fine. He's doing okay. And, um, you know, a lot of you are going to be wanting to enjoy this club for quite a few years to come. And if not you, then sort of that next generation behind you of members who's going to be interested in supporting the club going forward. So as you get into your latter years and you're playing only three days a week instead of seven <laughs> because the body doesn't recover as fast, et cetera, et cetera. It's like that irrigation equipment. Um, you know, you're going to need that next generation to come forward and support the club with good decisions. And the reason it didn't get done 20 years ago, probably many fold, many fold. But at the end of the day, I can tell you in the last couple of months, the rumors that have gone out, the, uh, all the discussion, all the, um, it hasn't been an easy position. It's not been an easy subject. When you get into member assessment, that's a lot of times when people go darting for the exits and it's no fun. It really isn't. And, you know, the, Bob Simon and Jim Mitchell, both, Bob's still on the board, made a comment, and one of the reasons I came to Briarwood was to get it to a next generation because the golf clubs over on the other side of the river, when the bill came due, like this one is, they had not saved any money, they didn't have the interest in moving forward, they hadn't planned. We've done a better job of planning. We've actually done okay in the last couple of years, remarkably. Um, so we've got more money than we used to. We have a lot of needs for that money. Uh, those clubs on the other side of the river did not do well. Their daily fee, their golf courses that you wouldn't really want to play very much because they struggle. You know, they're good enough for daily fee, but it's, they're not selling any real equity memberships to a club like that. And the reason you belong to a private club is hopefully for a better quality experience and something that you can sustain, something that you can get on your golf course, all sorts of good reasons to do it. They didn't save. They didn't take the bold step that this board and this membership is now being asked to take, and it is a bold step. It's a big deal. Last time we did an assessment was 2002, $2,500. Mrs. McCleary, how many members did we have back then? Do you remember? Well, more, yeah. There, I'm going to guess you were probably into the 300s at that uh, high 300s. Anyway, tables and chairs, 2500 bucks, And they were a good investment. I think we're still sitting on a lot of them, still using them. Um, so it's a very important time for this club and its history. And that's why I left California, was to come to the desert to enjoy it. This is a perfect project. I, I really pray that this membership um, thinks long and hard about uh, what, what we're leaving, what legacy we're going to leave for um, the next generation. So um, with, with that being said, said, questions. And if you do have a question, can I get you just to line up over there? Because it'll help when we get on the, on the video. Hello. Hello. My name is George Gray. First question I have is, what would be the assessment if there was no flash players here? Flash sale folks, the three people, what would the assessment be? 
Oh, so if the flash sale members weren't here, and uh, flash sale are equity members, so they are they just have a reduced rate. So you can subtract forty from that. Um, there's probably another couple thousand couple thousand dollars um, from the from the uh, seventy one hundred. Question. Talk about planning. You guys are pretty good at planning. So what happened was you put out a flyer for 24 months minimum. Right. So most of us think, well, 24 months, we don't like it, we leave. What really happened was it was 27 months. You didn't advertise that. That's in the fine print. So now I'm the flash guy saying, I'm going to do my 24 months. As it turns out, after about four months, it just probably isn't going to work for us. But we're committed because we signed the contract. Right. So now, all of a sudden, you get three months tacked on because I didn't read the fine print. And that three months does two things. It gives you a lot of extra revenue, and it also gets us into this. Right? Well, it does. It, it, it uh, you're, this now. What, so it does get you into it. That's the question. That That's the, the answer. Okay. Right? No, not a, not really at all. It's in my shoes. I'm wondering all of a sudden when I was going to be done in 24 months, I now get an extra three months, and now I'm getting an assessment. Right. You don't think that was something you guys thought about that last year? Actually, when we did the flash sale, um, this project wasn't even contemplated. We knew we had water somewhere, but well, not near we, this. But we had sand. I appreciate that. You need to get money. Obviously, you didn't have enough money for sand. I have more sand in my backyard. All right. So we're past the question right. stage. Thank you. Mm. Mike? Just for clarification purposes. So the first phase is about $1.5 million. Yes. Have you identified any other phases after that? Sure. The three lakes. And then the final phase would be the DG, the desert landscaping around the perimeter of the golf course. So it would be resealing the lake so that we don't have the water loss out of lakes. Um, we need to figure out whether we'll, how much of that we'll actually need to be compliant. So that's, uh, that's why we're doing the irrigation system first so we really know exactly how much we have to save past that to become compliant. The, the numbers that I gave you, it should be 1. Uh, 1. 1.5. Okay, so that'll cover that, and then there could be a, something else, but much smaller. Yeah, it's significantly less, and if we, uh, you know, uh, continue to be good planners, we may be able to save some money as we go to pay for that eventuality. If, you know, we don't know if we have to do one or three. So, you know, we need to find out. We could go do all three of them right now, save a whole bunch of water, but if we don't need it, then, you know, it would have been maybe not a waste of money because it is a savings of water, um, but it would have been money we didn't have to put at it. It would have been a little overkill. We're trying to become compliant and have the best 90 acres of turf that we can. Thank you. Thanks. I second what George Craig just had to say, but I have a different avenue to take this. Is there a question? Uh, yeah, I'd like to, if for you to answer. You know what I'm going to say, Nate, because you asked me not to be disruptive. <laughs> but I'd like for everybody here to know that the board has been very negligent in what it is that they've done over the many, many years that they've been in place. They've swept things under the rug. They haven't addressed it. It is gross negligence. Which these assessments that are going to go against all of us are in turn damages due to their negligence. They have a commercial general liability policy. They also have an Arizona emission policy and probably one or two other policies that if everybody either gets together or you do it individually, send a letter saying, I want to make claim for the damages due to the negligence of this board or club. Those damages are compensable and they are payable off of that policy. If we were to go as far as litigation, the minutes that these people sit and talk about in all their meetings, it's all in writing. It's all discoverable. And don't think this has not come up in the past about all the problems and all the issues. Because when we joined two years ago, that's all we heard about. 
So they've known about it for a long time. It's their negligence that we're in this position. We're going to get the damages, which is compensable. I urge everybody, if anybody knows who their first general liability policy is, that'd be great to have. It'd save us all a lot of trouble. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right, do we have any contribution, any question regarding irrigation? All right, come on, let's go. First of all, I've been, um, my husband and I have been here for, this is our second year, and we love this golf course, and we've met so many neat friends, and so it's just really disheartening to hear all of this now, when um, in 2005 or 2008 was the last assessment that you had. Um, I could see one assessment, you know, of $7,000, but I don't, what I'm hearing, I don't hear that it's just one assessment, it's going to be another assessment, another assessment, and then dues increasing. You know, um, are the dues going to increase every year? I mean, what's going to happen? Um, um, it, do we need to find another golf course? Like, you know, I mean, 7000 and then if we have another 5000 another 5000 that's a, that's a lot of money to have here as a member, and I mean, I love the golf course, but it's just a, it's a lot, and I'm just curious, are the assessments and the dues going to increase quite a bit for all of us? So do, so the question is, do dues increase? They do? Well, I know dues increase, but right. are, and, I, and I know that, you know, we're one of those fire people, too. Flash sale. And, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and Joe said, hey, are you guys going to join? Of course we're going to stay. We love it. You know, we are going to the golf course for um, seven years, and then when we came over here during the COVID, Oh my gosh, we love this golf course. My husband loves his group. I love my group, but I just can't see loving it for twenty, thirty thousand dollars more. Yeah. You know, in the next few years. So I, I think that yeah, I understand your question. Um, you know, the the lion's share of this project should get us most water compliant. I can't give you a hundred percent answer because we don't know exactly the water savings from the irrigation system. We have a good idea, but until it actually happens. Um, we can't be pretty specific with it. The lake projects uh, that we're talking about, they're in the neighborhood of how much per lake, Ron? Just ballpark? Uh, a couple hundred? Yeah, I, I want to say all said and done when we priced it out in whatever, September, I think we were about five, six hundred thousand. For all three? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, I, you know, to be honest with you, um, I'd be, I'm speculating a little bit myself. Um, if we had to do more than one lake, I'd be surprised because I think that most of us think that we'll get most of the savings that we need from the irrigation system, the creek, and again, we'll have to evaluate it at that time. A couple hundred thousand dollars is a much different kettle of fish than 1.5. So dues will go up. I think that's inevitable, particularly with inflation. We all know that. Um, and in terms of assessments, um, you know, the one nice thing about having a little bit of cash in the bank through COVID and, and sort of the uh, fate, if you will, um, is that we've got some liquidity to take care of kitchen equipment, air conditionings. This is how clubs work. You guys are the owners. You're an equity owner of the club, and there's no other entity to help us with that. We don't budget for a big profit. We don't make large profits. You know, if we make $10,000, we're pleased. So we don't, but we do collect money for the replacement of, of uh, assets that we have, just not to this extent. So I hear what you're saying, and, and everyone you know, has to make that evaluation and why you're here, how long you want to be here. Um, it is not uncommon for equity clubs to make significant investments in their club. There are members here, uh, there are clubs back home of you know, 10, 15, 20, $40,000 uh, assessments for improvements. So, you know, would we have rather have done one in 2010? I think you remember 08. It was probably not a very flush time for the club. So, you know, there's a lot of things. I wasn't here then. Yeah, well, uh, but there was a generation that did the best they could to kind of get us here. Um, and and uh, did we do all the things that uh, we should have, could have done? No. It's, you know, these assessments are never fun topics, uh, but it is how we do major improvements to the club. What about an assessment of $1,000 a year for the next, you know, 10 years or something for membership as opposed to 7000 and then who knows what the second assessment is, who knows what the third assessment is? So we talked about financing options for $7,000. Um, I know, but there's another assessment probably coming in another one after that. 
I, you know, I, I think that's actually presumptuous that we would be. I, I think with the numbers that we've talked about, if we plan and if we're smart, we might be able to accumulate enough cash uh, to not have to go the assessment route. Like I said at the beginning of the meeting, when we talk about assessments, it's usually when people head for the exits. So we're not anxious to do it. And, you know, honestly, it's, uh, there's a lot of encouragement not to have assessments, but this is something that has to be done. It's not a, uh, uh, it's not a want, it's, it's a need to. So I, I, I would caution you to go too uh, deep on uh, a second assessment and how much that would cost, because I, I think you're overshooting the runway a little bit. Okay. Well, I'm just looking into the future, too. I got you. I got you. We're not going to be here 30, 40 years. <laughs> well, I probably am. <laughs> All right. So unlike Connie, I am still with Grandview, and my husband George and I joined for 24 months, and we figured we'd only be playing for 24 months. We have not had anything that the assessment, the course hasn't been any better, and we're leaving at the end of September because that is our 27 month, even though we're on 24. How come I have to pay $7,000 for nothing that I'm going to get no improvement? Well, you don't have to, and um, because you do have a vote, you can certainly vote no for it. And I think that you won't be the only no vote in the entire club. I'm just going way out on, out on a limb here. Right. So, you know, the interesting thing about that in perspective, you have been the benefit of a lot of monies that were spent prior to your coming here. Totally get it. it. It is your. I get it. It's your point of view. I've got a lot of members that are extremely happy uh, with yeah, with it. Great. Yeah, it is. I'm so not we. And it's okay. I totally get it, and I would. I would strongly encourage you to vote no. Okay. Thank you. Oh no! Here he comes. This is Mr. Ken Ziora. Uh, so, Nate, uh, we're talking about assessments for golf members, uh, both uh, equity and non-equity. There are approximately 306, I believe, social members that enjoy memberships window at the golf course uh, when they walk through that door for the day or whatever. And while I understand there's no uh, provision for us to assess them, for this project, is there or are there plans to sort of appeal to their sense of uh, fairness and kick in some uh, money to help us along with these types of things? There, there is, and it's a good point, again, that you raise, Gabe, and that is that um, one of the many blessings of Briarwood over the last uh, four years anyway, uh, there have been donations in excess of $350,000 made to this club. Many of you are in this room tonight who have done so. And it's unbelievable. It's unlike anything that you would see at, at many equity clubs uh, across the country. It's a generous group. There's a lot of social members that love this club. They love coming here. They don't play golf. Uh, but they love uh, spending time with friends, and uh, you know if if the assessment if we're not able to afford to do this, then the next phases of of discussion get very very different, and it does jeopardize the social social memberships enjoyment of the club. It jeopardizes it significantly. Um, Briarwood's an asset to Sun City West. And I think that somewhere, uh, with a request, a polite, uh, respectful request, uh, social members uh, will, will participate at some level. If I bet money, I'd bet a, a fair amount that there'd be quite a bit of money donated by social memberships. Um, I could be wrong, but I think that would happen. So, it, you know, for a, for a project like this, um, a volunteer type of, of uh, uh, donations, just aren't sufficient to cover this. You know, we had um, hopes that uh, we could out of the Briarworth campaign. I got almost two hundred thousand dollars, but you know, it's it's um, uh, this is a big project and uh, it needs help and and we need to work at this. These are the hard decisions that clubs have to make, and uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm excited, I'm scared, I'm I'm a lot of things, 
um, but I'm optimistic. Um, I have no idea how this membership will vote on something like this, but I'm excited to answer questions. Um, I really want the result of world-class irrigation system on our property to see what we can do with turf density because I, we've got pure fairways, we've got tees that can be, you know, uh, much, much better. And Ron's the guy to get us there. Um, and the technology that we're talking about putting, it in, putting in uh, will help get us there. I want to see no complaints about bad lies. I don't want to hear any of it, you know? So that's, uh, that's the goal, and I think that's an attainable thing. Um, we just have to work pretty hard at it. All right. Yes, Mr. Chanick? I was going to say is that I beg of you to ask questions. You got them there, okay? Don't wait and go to the bar and start talking about all this stuff. Get yeah. the school for right here. They're sitting here. Our biggest difficulty in trying to chart this course for the we're going with the course is we don't know what you feel. I have some members coming to me saying, "My goodness, it's about time to ask for somebody. We got to do something about this." I've got others saying, I'm back in my bags tomorrow, okay? And we don't know how you feel, and we won't ever know unless you speak up, okay? So all I'm doing is begging you. If you have something, say it. We'd love to listen to it. What, what about a loan? So, yeah, we talked about loans, and we there's a lot of uh, issues to the loans that uh, we you know we had a very good bank uh, relationship that we've got going, um, and they're they're interested in participating. The funny thing about loans is that they do have to be paid back, and yeah, it's a way to do that. So the tack that we took was to have members able to easily access those loans for the assessment and have that payback with the bank. They're really acting as uh, on our benefit uh, to, to be able to do that. You know, the complication comes, I sell my membership and you know, a year, what happens to my money? I'm not getting my money back. What about the people coming in? We wanna be able to get the quality of the golf course where it's supposed to be, and then be able to you know, get a, an initiation fee. You know, membership committee meeting has a meeting next week to talk about initiation fees and, and going a little bit north. We need, to, we need to recognize that people coming in have to contribute to the, the pie as well as the current equity members. Yes, Ms. Lodgelin. Is my time up? Uh, actually, we have about two minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm surprised no one has asked what Plan B is if this doesn't get voted through. But what is Plan B? Well, I'm going to go to the, yeah, that is good. Um, plan B. I wrote it in my blast, and again, grab a copy of it. Let me get my glasses out here. I don't have them memorized. Yeah, I think I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. But I... I yeah. So, doggone it. The only page that I don't have. Okay. Uh, oh, offer to, uh, option two. Plan B. Uh, offer the club for sale to a member consortium willing to invest uh, an, an, an amount commensurate with the value of the club that's willing to, uh, to float it. That's, that's uh, certainly uh, probably a second option in, in my view. That, that's nothing that's been discussed significantly with the board. Um, option three is restrict water the best we can. Take the product that is delivered. Uh, we would end up looking more like Hillcrest. We wouldn't be able to charge the rates, and it would just be a kind of a, a downward spiral. And then option four would be to list the club for sale as something other than a golf course. So that's kind of where it goes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be optimistic and hope that we don't get that uh, get there. But uh, anyway, I appreciate you asking. Thank you. Seeing, seeing that these process projects aren't due until 2023, what is the timing of the assessment? Well, we would uh, um, once we get done with the membership meetings, uh, the last one to be taken place on May 3rd, uh, which would be our normal briefing date. Um, we would then uh, go forward with the, uh, the, uh, the vote. Uh, you'd likely have uh, to the probably the end of May to uh, cast a ballot 
and uh, whatever the result of that vote was at that time would be uh, what we end up doing. So I would think that by June, we would know how this is going to proceed. Follow-up question? But if this is a phased-in project, you don't need the money right away. You don't need it until May of 2023. Well, we actually need it now because, Rick, we actually have to uh, get the money now because we need to purchase the equipment because as of May 2nd, the irrigation heads themselves, just by the heads, are going up a, another 100000 bucks. So it gets worse, and, and uh, you have to order it. There's delays in getting this. This stuff just isn't on a truck ready to get delivered. So I appreciate that. In the, in the likelihood, I think the small chance that the vote doesn't pass, and we have to go to an option B, what's the possibility of selling off part of the club and reconstituting it and hopefully raising enough cash to make the necessary corrections. That's an option that, that's being discussed, um, and we're, we're digging into that just a little bit deeper. Uh, what Mr. Aiken is talking about is maybe a portion of the, the golf course could be sold off, and we would end up having to reconfigure the golf course in the remaining acreage. So it's a little different scope of project, um, and we're going to find out from someone who is used to doing that type of project if that's viable or not. We need to see if it's viable. And so far, we are um, we don't have enough uh, mm, authoritative decision on that. Wouldn't that be a uh, earlier decision than a later decision? Well, it, w it may not uh, require an assessment if you do that. Right. And we need to see if it's viable. And, and that, ha that discussion is kind of ongoing. It's being discussed uh, by people who know if it's viable, would know. Yes. Hi, just a quick comment. Those of us who have had come from other country clubs around the states have paid a lot of money to for initiation fees. I know when we joined the club, my husband and I, we paid seventy five hundred. We left a club in Seattle that was three times that just to join. So, you know, now a lot of these people have paid nothing or a thousand dollars. So, I mean, that's a benefit to them as well. So, just putting things in perspective. Yep, it is. I, I would like to second her comment. I came from Missoula, Montana. I joined the Missoula Country Club 10 years ago. It cost me 4500 bucks to buy in. And the dues were about the same as they are here. I'd like to thank the board and the contractors and the people that have been the experts for this, for all the work you put in. I'd like to know how many votes it's going to take to pass. Right. Well, it depends uh, on, on when we send the ballots out. So it, uh, it really requires 50% uh, plus one uh, to, of, of the membership uh, to, uh, to vote. So if we have 180, that would be 91 it would require. I think the bigger question you have to ask yourself, is that sufficient to get the entirety of the membership to pay the assessment? It is a democratic process. They vote. Um, the big question is, you know, what's the, what's the fall off? Yeah. So 50% plus one carries the day of the membership. Hey, um, we're not in equity. And we joined this club five years ago. It's the best thing that we did. The memberships that we have in this club, we would never have gotten at any of the rec courses. The, and I think the club is in great shape as far as, as, as it can be. But I just want to say thank you to the board. Thank you to the gentlemen that are up there for all your hard work. I know the board has worked really hard. Um, I know several members of the board. And I wouldn't do it. <laughs> God bless them for doing it. But I hope, the, I hope the membership votes for it. And I will be happy as an equity member to pay the $3,500 because it's worth it to me. Thank it's you. It's worth, it's worth. We know what she meant, non-equity. Right here, and everybody here, and what we have, there is nothing. Because if you play at Portobello, you can't get on. If you play at Trilogy, you can't get on. You know, and this is, this is a gold mine. And we need to put the gold back in it, like what you're gonna do, so thank you. You bet. <laughs> Now, 
Nate and I have had a lot of conversations right. over the last few years. My name is Jane Johnson, and I've just come back here after being home in Boston for about since 2018. My husband and I bought a home here in, 20, in uh, 1992, and we were just coming from vacation. Played all the courses, and you're talking about Hillcrest. It was one of the most beautiful courses I've ever seen. When I we came here, it was just lush green all. Oh, it was spectacular. And then you see what happens to it, because I played in the ladies' league there for years, in the mud at the end. <laughs> but anyway, the club, when we joined, we joined in 2000. And the club was then realizing the older people from 1980s were not playing golf as much, and they needed to get new members. So I saw an ad in the paper, and it was for $500 you could come over here and play golf, and talk to the manager. John Kaufman at the time. And so we came over and tried it. We had no idea we were going to join. And we had so much fun, we played every day. And they said, you could shoot a cannon down there in the afternoon if you want to play golf. We asked about that. And so we joined right away in that fall. So we've seen a lot of the ups and downs of clubs. <coughs> and it is, it's a wonderful club. And I want you to know, it's 2018. I paid my golf dues. And I haven't even been here. So I've supported it in a different way. And I know it's expensive. I belong to a club back home. And that was 65000 just for your initiation fee. And the, uh, to tell you the truth, the uh, PGA chairman, Jay Monaghan, is from my club. So anyway, I know it's expensive, but it's a wonderful place. And uh, so I'm sure a lot of you feel the same way. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. <laughs> Yeah, that's some serious dedication. I enjoy my annual phone calls with Mrs. Johnson, and we get to talk about all things and, and uh, always enjoyable, so thank you. Um, all right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with a story. I, I, I rarely do it. I know my board members' eyeballs are rolling back uh, right now, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'll make it quick. So um, a couple of years ago, we did a... Uh, a tea party over in the patio room and we had invited the founding members of the club. Uh, the youngest age I think was uh, uh, 89 uh, and uh, these are people who had been at the club uh, from the beginning, almost the beginning. And I did a little exercise with them, you know, we, they all talked about the things they enjoyed about the club and whatnot. and then at the end of it I, I said, uh, listen, I want you to think about something the last uh, 30 years that you've been in the club. I want you to close your eyes for a moment and I want you to think about your lives and what they would have been like if there was no Briarwood. And, you know, an obedient group they were. They did, most of them closed their eyes. Some of them were closed before I started. <laughs> and they said, uh, and, and the, you know, I'm looking at the audience and all these people with their eyes closed and then they heard it and their mouths went, you know, their, their jaws dropped because they saw 30 years of memories and friendships and, you know, really their lives uh, that wouldn't have been here and all the things that they'd experienced. We've got a lot of people in this room that are still living good, solid lives, and we want to kind of perpetuate that. It's a big deal. Part of an equity club is to pay it forward and to bring it forward. And, uh, you know, some people might complain about what didn't get done, you know, back in the day. but I'm telling you, uh, this membership has a chance to make a difference and to be different. And uh, I kind of think it's an obligation on all our parts to kind of move it forward that way. And uh, I, I'm like Tom, Mr. Chanick, I'm, uh, I'm begging you because I think this place is worth it. The friendships and the memories that get uh, developed here, they're uh, priceless. So without any further questions, uh, do I have a... Yes, Mr. Chanick. Oh, God. Can't you? Okay. It's worth it. He has some dilly sometimes. No, no, this is. The question always comes do you want to cough up five, six thousand dollars at the golf course? And why now? And all this sort of thing. But what I have to say is this uh, I've been here for. I think 12 years now, and in those 12 years, 
we have been enjoying, I have been enjoying, a dollar's worth of entertainment, and I've been paying only about 90 cents. <laughs> and as a result, the club has been squeezing things down, and some of the things that we're supposed to be doing haven't been done. Okay? So I look at, even though I don't have many years to go here, uh, I probably owe the club an assessment to pay for what I didn't do. I'll take your check now. <laughs> but the, the, the new people, you say, what about the people that are just coming? Well, look at the assessment as a joining fee. The, the originators paid a hell of a lot more than that, okay? And, and then you look at the middle group. They've been here five years, and they're, they've, they've, got, they've had five good years. And some of the people have had really good years because they paid 70 cents for a dollar's worth of stuff. I hear you. Okay? And they're going to have another five years where they can enjoy the place after we do these things. And, and I can see that this is tough to take, but if you sit down and rationalize it, you'll say, if we want to have a private country club that is like Briarwood that we control with this group of people, must do things like this. Okay. All right. I'll take that as a yes. All right, folks. I have to go to the airport and get my son. <laughs> Meeting's adjourned. Thank you.